Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to introduce you to the concept of creation and annihilation operators in quantum mechanics. We'll be trying to understand exactly what they represent, and hopefully we'll be seeing why they're named the way they are as well. If you enjoyed this video then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Okay, so collectively, creation and annihilation operators are called ladder operators. This is a much less exciting name, but we'll see why it works shortly. Before we see what a ladder operator is in the world of quantum physics, let's start with some basic classical physics. Let's imagine we're looking at a simple harmonic oscillator. This is basically anything that undergoes a particular kind of motion, known as simple harmonic motion. For example, we could set up a mass and a spring like this. When we pull the mass in a particular direction away from its natural or equilibrium position, the spring will exert a force on that mass, trying to return the whole system back to its natural position. Now the force that this spring exerts is directly proportional to how far we move the mass away from its natural position. The more we move the mass away, the larger the force. Additionally, the force acts in the opposite direction to the displacement. So if we move the mass to the right, the force acts to the left, and if we move the mass to the left, the force acts to the right. Now, the way that this mass moves, essentially bouncing back and forth left and right, is known as simple harmonic motion. And simple harmonic motion occurs, generally speaking, when the force is directly proportional to the displacement and the force is acting in the opposite direction to the displacement. Technically, simple harmonic motion is defined in terms of the acceleration of the object rather than the force, but close enough for our purposes. Now, another way to think about a simple harmonic oscillator like this is by considering what's known as its potential energy. In this particular case, we'll be looking at the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that this potential energy for a spring is given by half kx squared, where k is known as the spring constant, basically just a property of the spring, and x is, of course, the displacement. The important thing here is that the potential energy is quadratic. It depends on x squared, the displacement squared. And this allows us to use a neat visualization trick. It allows us to visualize any simple harmonic oscillator as a ball moving around in a quadratic potential well. Basically, if we plot potential energy against displacement on a graph, then we can use a little ball moving around inside that well as a convenient way of thinking about our simple harmonic oscillator. And so if our simple harmonic oscillator is at a particular displacement, say x1, then we can imagine that the ball has moved to a displacement of x1, and we can look at our graph to tell us exactly how much potential energy is relevant to the system here. The ball, of course, is just an analogy for our simple harmonic oscillator. It's not an actual ball rolling around in some well. But what does all of this have to do with quantum mechanics and ladder operators, the creation and annihilation operators that we're meant to be talking about? Well, one place in which ladder operators are useful is in the study of a quantum harmonic oscillator. Quantum harmonic oscillators are systems where the potential energy once again is quadratic, just like the mass on a spring, but they're quantum rather than classical. Now, real perfect quantum harmonic oscillators are difficult to find in real life, but we can approximate so many quantum systems as quantum harmonic oscillators that the study of quantum harmonic oscillators is very useful indeed. For example, we could be studying a single row of positive ions inside a metal. Remember, a metal consists of positive ions, generally thought to be stationary in position, with a whole bunch of free electrons surrounding these ions, known as the sea of electrons. And we can take a look at the potential energy an electron should be experiencing as a result of this row of ions. It looks something like this. And each of these little wells can basically be approximated as a quantum harmonic oscillator which means that we can use the study of quantum harmonic oscillators to predict how electrons should behave in each one of these so-called potential wells. Essentially, if an electron were to be found here, we could find out something about the energy of that electron in this region of space. This is similar to how we used the potential well earlier to find out something about the energy of our classical harmonic oscillator. Now, the major difference between classical and quantum harmonic oscillators is that a quantum harmonic oscillator can only be found in particular energy levels. So for example, an electron in this potential well can only be found with very specific energy values. This is known as quantization, and it does not apply in the classical case. In the classical case, our oscillator could have basically any energy value in this range. 
Now I've discussed quantized energy levels in other videos on my channel before. So if that idea is unfamiliar to you, then please do check out some of the links in the description below, or you can start with this video up here. Coming back to our quantum harmonic oscillator then, we can say that the electron is allowed to have specific energy values. And for convenience, I'm also going to be drawing in the wave function for each one of these quantum states, these allowed states. Just as a quick overview, if we took any one of these wave functions and squared it, we would be calculating the probability of finding our electron at a particular point in space. For example, if our electron has this energy, meaning that it's in this energy level, then the wave function for that looks like this. And if we square it, it looks like this. And what that tells us is that the electron is most likely to be found here and not so likely to be found here or here. Okay, so if quantum harmonic oscillators can only be found at particular energy levels, then one question that we can ask is, what are the energy values of these energy levels? Are they like 0 0.01 joules or 10 joules or what are they? What are the actual numerical energy values? More interestingly, we can ask how far apart are these energy levels? And another interesting question we can ask is, can our quantum harmonic oscillator transition between different levels over time? Can the electron move from one energy level to another? In other words, can it gain energy to go from here to here or from here to here, for example? And can it lose energy to go back down? Well, this is where our ladder operators finally come into the picture. Without them, we would have to solve the Schrodinger equation for this particular scenario in order to work out each one of these energy values. I've discussed how to solve the Schrodinger equation in a previous video on my channel, check it out up here, and it's a bit of a faff to say the least. But the ladder operators are a mathematical rearrangement that makes life a lot easier. The way to use these ladder operators is to take the wave function for one of these states, let's say the lowest one, and to apply a particular ladder operator to this state, which will then end up giving us the wave function for the next energy level. This particular ladder operator that I've written here is known as the creation operator because it takes our system from a particular energy level up to the next one. By applying this ladder operator to our original wave function, we're in essence creating energy within our system. Now in reality, that energy of course has to be absorbed by the system from somewhere else. So we're not really creating any energy as much as giving energy to our system, but we're creating the ability for our system to go from one state to a higher energy state. And in simpler terms, the electron is gaining enough energy to go from here to the next state. And so the point is the creation operator is the mathematical equivalent of giving our electron just enough energy to move up to the next energy level. And that's why it's known as the creation operator. And as you might be able to imagine, the other operator does the exact opposite. It takes energy away from the system so that our electron drops from one energy level to the one just below it. Therefore, this operator is known as the annihilation operator. And together, the creation and annihilation operators are known as the ladder operators because you're essentially climbing the rungs of a ladder, up or down, depending on which operator you use. And it's worth me noting, by the way, that when I say that an electron or our quantum system is moving up or down energy levels, it's not physically going up or down anywhere. It's actually just gaining or losing energy. Now, at this point, it might seem like the creation and annihilation operators with their interesting names sound a lot cooler than they actually are. But here's the thing, being able to work out what any of the allowed wave functions are for our system, given just one of them, is super powerful. And these operators can do a little bit more as well. To see this, we first need to take a look at the Schrodinger equation very briefly. This is of course the main equation of quantum mechanics, the governing equation, if you will. It's the one that tells us how wave functions change and evolve over time. And whenever we happen to be studying any quantum system, we essentially adapt to the Schrodinger equation to fit our system and then solve it so that we learn something about that system. Rather interestingly, the Schrodinger equation for this particular scenario, a quantum harmonic oscillator, can be written in terms of the ladder operators. We won't go into full details about this mathematical restatement, but do feel free to pause the video and check that the maths is hopefully correct. The reason that this is useful though, is because this term here, the creation operator followed by the annihilation operator, actually measures the number of quanta of energy in our system. Now, what do I mean by this? If our system, our electron in this case, is in the lowest possible energy state, the ground state, then we say that it has no quanta of energy within it. In order to move up to the next energy level, it has to gain one quantum of energy. You may be familiar with the idea that electrons in atoms can absorb photons and move up to higher energy levels. 
Well, this is exactly the same, except we're going to refer to the amount of energy needed as one quantum. And every time our system, in this case our electron, transitions from one energy level to another, it gains a quantum if it's going up and it loses a quantum if it's going down. So these labels that we give our energy levels, 0, 1, 2, 3, are not just convenient numbers. They're a measure of how many quanta of energy are needed to get to that particular energy level from the ground state. And this term, creation followed by annihilation operator, actually measures that number of quanta. If we take the wave function of any one of these states and we apply this term to that wave function, then the end result is basically the number of quanta required to get to that energy level from the ground state. The detailed mathematics of this deserves a video of its own, so let me know if you'd like me to make that. Now all of this stuff that we've just looked at, the ability to find the number of quanta required to get to a particular energy level, as well as being able to write the Schrodinger equation in terms of the creation and annihilation operators, will allow us with a bit of simplified mathematics to actually find the energy value of each energy level without having to solve the Schrodinger equation in any detail. As it turns out, the actual energy value for each energy level ends up being this quantity here. H-bar is a constant in quantum mechanics known as the reduced Planck constant. Omega is a property of the potential well itself, which means that different sized and different shaped potential wells will have different omega values. And of course, we've got the number of quanta in any given energy level plus one half. So here's why this is so powerful. Let's say we just want to find out the energy value for a particular energy level. Let's say energy level number five. And we're trying to find the energy for n is equal to five in a given potential well, which in this case looks like this. If we know this information, we can easily find out the value of omega, so this is not a problem. h-bar is just a constant, and we know that in this particular case, we're looking at n is equal to five. So we just plug these numbers in, and we know immediately what the energy value is for the n is equal to five level in this exact potential well. Now this expression of course only applies to quantum harmonic oscillators, but we can find similar expressions for other systems that behave in roughly similar ways as well. So those are just some of the benefits of using creation and annihilation operators in quantum mechanics. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. I have some new merch out now. It's a quantum mechanical dice design. I had a lot of fun creating it. So if you'd like to check some out, please do go over to the store tab on my channel or click the link in the description below. Also, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, then there's a link to that in the description below as well. A massive thank you to my Giga Patrons and thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you very soon.